welcome everyone if you just joined us. My name is Carrie O'Neill and I'm a curriculum specialist with Mountain Desert Career Pathways. Um, I really am excited for today. We have um, the crew from Hinkley Dairy right here. Great family, the DeVries family. Um, Ken DeVries, his wife Sherry and their sons Josh and Daniel have created some outstanding videos for us. We have some technical issues that we're running through today. So I'm going to be showing you um, the segments of the videos and um, then Ken, Josh, Sherry, and Daniel will be answering any of those questions that come after. So those videos are basically the processes and procedures that are ongoing with the dairy that they felt were um, something that you guys would be interested in. So we're gonna go ahead and allow Ken to introduce himself and his family, and then we're gonna go ahead and get started. Hi everyone. Hey, uh, welcome to Hinkley Dairy. Uh, my name is Ken DeVries and my wife Sherry, my sons Joshua and Daniel are here. And uh, just want to say that we're a family business, a family owned business, and we're really excited to be a part of this. Awesome. Um, now, just a question now, how long have you owned the dairy or been running the dairy before we even get started? 27 years. 27 years. And prior to dairy farming, were you having your own dairy farm? Did you work on another farm? Yes, uh, I grew up in the Chino area. So I grew up on my grandfather's dairy farm and worked for several other dairies as growing up as early as 10 years old, I would say. Awesome. And uh, Sherry has the same background too. Mm -hmm. And you grew up on your family's dairy. Yeah, here in Hinkley, about five miles from here. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, we grew up in the industry. Sure, the first video is an introduction and, and kind of a recap of everything that you're going to be seeing. And, um, and then Josh, our, is the first one the milky? Yeah, so the first video, you're going to see a quick intro to the dairy, a little bit about what we're going to talk about throughout the whole video. And then right when that intro is done, we're going to see inside the milking parlor and it's going to explain how we milk the cows. Hi, welcome to Hinkley Dairy. My name is Ken DeVries and this is my wife, Sherry. And we own, co-own and operate along with my sons, Daniel and Joshua, Hinkley Dairy. We milk about a thousand cows two times a day, and we also uh, raise another thousand head of young stock. Those are babies all the way up to two years old. We have 14 employees, great employees that help us out every day. We also farm about 250 acres of feed to feed our cows. And we also have a solar farm that provides the electrical power for all of our operations. Hey, follow along. We'll show you what the dairy is all about. Okay, so in this area, we're going to bring you inside the milking parlor, watch the cows give their milk, and how we do that. So, one thing I got to ask you guys is we got to be very quiet. Cows like call and consistency to let their milk down. So, come follow me. Well, now we're in the milking parlor, and the cows just came in to get milk. And the first thing we do is apply a pre-dip. And the pre-dip is to disinfect the skin on the teeth and also it's got a lotion on it to keep the skin soft. Okay, after we apply the pre-dip, we check the milk to make sure that it's white and clear of any kind of uh, infection. So after the dipping and checking the milk, the cows are wiped clean and then our automatic machines are attached to the quarters these machines uh, operate by vacuum 
and pulsation. So there's constant magnetic field on and off, on and off, on and off. And it uh, the catalyst the milk down after all that preparation down into the machine and then into a uh, sensor. The sensor will uh, detect when the cow is done milking by no milk going through there and then it will automatically pull the machine off. Now when the cow is finished milking, it automatically comes off. We apply tip dip to the teeth. So as the cow milks, goes through the sensor, down into our pipeline, and the pipeline up to the front of the barn. Collects in a receiver tank where a uh, variable speed pump will pump it through a filter and up into the milk house. Who will be in? I'll show you the milk house. No one's coming in. Okay, as it comes in, it comes to a plate cooler. And there's two sections to our plate cooler. The first one is the milk is being cooled by our tap water. Uh, for some reason, we got really cold tap water here. So we're using that coolness to cool down about three to four degrees of the milk. So we got uh, cold water coming in. And then if you were here to fill it, you could feel hot water coming out. So we're taking some temperature off the milk just from our tap water. And then the next section is uh, our chiller. We have a chiller in the next room that is constantly refrigerating water down about 33, 32 degrees. And then every other slat is milk and the other one is ice water. And we get our milk down to about 34, 35 degrees. Okay, and then up, down here, and into our silo. It's a milk silo. It holds about 8,000 gallons. It's constantly agitated here. About every five minutes, we agitate the milk because raw milk, the fat solids will rise to the top. So we need to keep it mixed up. And also, the tank is very well insulated where it'll keep the milk at a good 34 degrees. Okay, I want to talk to you a little bit about our tap water that we draw out of our well. Um, Remember uh, earlier I told you that we use the cold water to take the temperature off of our milk here at this plate cooler? And uh, we use that water up to three times, this one being number one. And then the second time, I want to show you where this warm water will go and explain to you what we do with it then. So come follow me. this pipe and into our storage tank right here and then we're going to use this water to wash our cows with. Every time our cows come in to get milk we wash them called a wash pen. So we want to make sure that there's no manure or anything on those udders and just clean the cows up every time they go in to get milk. So that's the second time we use the same amount of water. Cows come in twice a day. They're probably in the barn for about an hour at a time because uh, we want them to go back and eat, rest, lay down, chew their cud, make more milk. So we, they're in the barn for an hour. By the time they enter the milking parlor, they're, it's probably taken a whole 10 minutes to get the whole process done. But the actual milking time will be about three minutes. Okay. And how much milk are you getting in that three minutes? Our average is about 75, 77 pounds. Uh, everything is done by weight on the dairy. So in gallon wise, what is that? That's about eight to 10 gallons per cow on, on a daily per basis. Day, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, so. okay. 
All right, so we do have a question in the chat. Uh, we had a student ask, where can we find the milk that your farm produces? Oh, that's a good question. So our milk, uh, it, we belong to a cooperative called Dairy Farmers of America, and they market our milk. 100% of our milk goes to Altadena Dairy. You can find them in most of the local grocery stores, including uh, Stater Brothers. And uh, not only Altadena Dairy, but also uh, Stater Brothers brands milk it, uh, there too, and all the different other products that they make. If you see a dairy product that has the real California seal on it, you'll see it uh, usually in the bottom corner of the package. That means that it comes from California dairies and that's all of our milk gets pulled into one spot and to use all those products. So as long as you see that seal, you're supporting us. Yes, good point. Awesome, another question in the chat guys. So how long does the cooling process actually take? Okay, well the cooling process is instantly, as soon as it goes through that plate cooler, uh, within seconds after it, it's received from the cow, it's cooled down to 34 degrees. So it doesn't take very- Hi. My name is Daniel DeVries. I'm in charge of all our farming around here, which means I grow all our hay. But before we go talking about all our crops and how we grow our hay, we gotta start where the plant starts, in the soil. But what in the dirt makes our plants grow? Well, just like us, we need to eat and drink so we can grow and plants need to do the same. Inside soil is fertilizer. And that fertilizer contains nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, sulfur, all things needed to grow a big strong crop. So our soil gets those nutrients by us applying the cow's poop, the manure, to the soil. You can, little, you can see little bits of it here and there. And that's filled with nutrients. And in the ground you have small microbial life. And that microbial life will eat away at all the manure and all the sticks all the organic matter and out of them comes plant available nutrients that the plant can take up and grow so we just got done washing all our cows and washing the barn with all that water now where does it go well all that manure and water collects in this pit right here out of that pit we have all that waste water and what we do with it is we pump it up to this giant screen right here. And this screen will filter out the solids from the liquids. Obviously the solids fall in this big pile right here. Let me show you what we do with the water. So we take that wastewater, which basically is just liquefied manure, packed with nutrients, and we spread it on our crops. So as I said before, our cow poop is what provides nutrition for our crops. But how do you get all this thick, clumpy manure to be readily available for the plant. Let me show you. Well, it all gets loaded into here. We'll hook this spreader up to a tractor. We'll bring it to that pen, we load it up. And this gets carried over to a field that's nice and bare and ready for a new crop. And this spreader will spin these tines here and this will break up all the big clods and spread it nice and even on our fields, creating nice, fine, plants available nutrients. So how do we get all that fine manure down into the ground. We gotta get it down there so that it's in the root system of the plants. Well, we'll drag our disc and other tillage equipment over the field with a tractor. That'll mix the dirt and the manure really well. We have our manure fertilizer, it's on the field. We've ran our tillage through the field, mixing it in, created that really nice seed bed. Now it's time to plant our crop. And we do that with what's called a seed drill pulled behind this tractor. Let me show you what it looks like. So in here is where we keep our seed. Let me show you. When we go to plant, we'll put our seed in here. And if we look at the bottom of this cedar, we find that it has little troughs. And the seed will fall down into that. And let me show you the bottom of this. They'll fall down the bottom of that and go down these rubber hoses here. The bottom of these rubber hoses is a pair of discs. And what these discs do is they make a small furrow in the ground that the seed will then drop into. Once that seed drops, it has to get recovered again with soil, enough so that we have good, what's called seed to soil contact. 
And that is achieved with this here. This is a ring roller that will then, again, bury the seed with soil. So our soil is prepped, our cedar's filled, we've ran through the field, we got seed in the ground, and now we irrigate. And over time, we will get seedling plants just like this and a nice long rows throughout the entire field. So there's three crops that we grow here to feed our cows. The first one is the cereal grain, uh, more specifically wheat, and that's what this crop is here. So the other two crops that we grow, first is sedan grass, but that's not in season, so I can't show that to you, sorry. But our third crop, and the crop that we probably spend the most time growing, is alfalfa. We grow alfalfa because it's filled with protein. And that protein, the cow can use to create lots of really good milk. So in alfalfa farming, we have uh, certain pests that we have to deal with throughout the year. The first being insects. We deal with what's called aphids and weevils. And what they do is they'll eat away at the leaves of the plants and the sugars of the plants. And the leaf on the plant is what, as dairymen, we want. The leaf is where all the protein is at. And so we're constantly monitoring our plants, trying to see what the aphid and weevil populations are. But not just them, there's also beneficial insects, and those will eat at the aphids and the weevils. One of the biggest ones that we have here is lady beetles, or as a lot of people know them as ladybugs. Let me come show you here. We got a lot right in front of you. Here we have the ladybug, or lady beetle, in its larvae stage. These will eat about 30 aphids, or weevils, a day. We also have adults right here. And they also help us to uh, protect our crop from insects that might harm our plants. So finally, it's time to reap what we sow. We prepared our soil, we put the manure into the ground, we fed our crops with nutrition, we've given them water to drink, we've taken care of our pests, and now it's time. Let's harvest our crop. Well, we harvest our hay two different ways. The first is green chop. Now the green chop is basically a giant mower behind the tractor that's pulled through the field. It'll collect up in a chute and it shoots it right to the back where there's a wagon. And that wagon will collect all that feed that we just harvested. And once we're done and we filled that wagon, we go head over back to the dairy. And that will feed out that feed right in front of all the milking cows on the dairy. And they love it. It's like candy to them. Fresh, fresh feed to make that great milk. Our next way that we harvest is baling. Now this one's a little more timely. You see, what we have to do is we go through with a different tractor called a swather. And that basically mows the whole field down and puts it into rows. These rows are about five foot wide and separated at 10 feet. And over time, the sun will take all the moisture out of that crop that's now laying on the ground. We call that our drying period. And as that dries, we will continually monitor it. And once it reaches the moisture that we want, which is below 20%, we will rake two of those rows, we call them windrows, into a bigger pile, a bigger windrow. And so I'll take another tractor with another implement called a baler. And what that baler will do is it will run over this now big windrow and it will collect all that hay. And it will pack it and pack it and pack it into a really dense hay bale. And that bale will be collected and then brought back over to the dairy. Now the advantage to baling is that it's dehydrated, which means that we can store it longer. There's no moisture in it that may cause mold or decay. So now that we have our hay baled, I told you that we brought it back to the dairy. Well, where we bring it is here in our big haystack along our mangers. And now this is where it will be kept until it's ready to be brought over to the commodity barn to be loaded and fed to the cows. But like I said before, the advantage of hay is that it's dehydrated and we can store it like this for a long time. But now we gotta keep the moisture off of it, especially rain. When rain comes, we have these nice tarps up on our haystacks. That rain will fall on top, bead off, roll off the sides, keeping our hay nice and protected.
Okay, guys, uh, now's time to ask questions about farming. Do you provide all of the hay that your animals eat or are you still buying some? Uh, we definitely still buy some. We produce like 40% yeah. of our own needs. All right, and then another question is, do you rotate crops to keep the soil nutrient uh, nutrient rich? Yes. Great question. So uh, we keep that alfalfa in for four years. It's a perennial crop, so it'll keep coming back year after year. And then oftentimes in between different crops, we apply that manure in the ground that keeps the soil rich with nutrients. And we'll follow with uh, the sedan grass in the summer. And then in the fall and winter and spring, we do uh, a wheat crop. All right, so um, another question, how fast does the alfalfa take to grow for you harvest it? That's a great question. So at the beginning of the season, um, it really depends on how warm it is that year. Uh, we now have been kind of tracking its growth since the beginning of March. And right now we're looking at possibly harvesting some of it. Uh, so after that, it's about a 28 day rotation and we'll get eight cuttings of alfalfa every year. All right, so if you wanna go ahead and just give a little brief about our next video, it is on the feed barn. Yeah, so in our, in our feed area, you know, that's probably our biggest expense is feeding the cows. So we need to do it accurately and we need to have top notch feed. And, um, and here's our neat little video about that. Okay, in this area here is where we keep all the commodities and feedstuffs that we use to feed our cows with. We have our hay commodities right here. Um, we have brought the hay bales over from our storage area and we set them here on the cement, take off the hay strings, and then we have it all ready to be able to put into our mixer wagon box and feed the cows both morning and afternoon. Okay, over here is a pile of cotton seed. Cotton seed is a, um, uh, a farmers have taken the cotton off of the seed and the seed is left. You can see part of it without the lint. It's black, but very digestible to a milk cow. And it's a good feed for cows in that it provides protein and uh, a lot of fiber. So uh, what would a farmer do with this cotton seed after they've taken off the cotton? Well, they'll use part of it to replant for next year, but there's so much more. So we feed it to a dairy cow. Another thing I'd like to show you is um, what's called a byproduct. And a good example of that is this right here. Um, these are called almond hull and shell. So the farmer will grow the tree to harvest the almonds. Around the almonds are the shell, the shell, and the hole. This is the hole. So what this is called a byproduct. We've taken the almond out and the farmer has sold those almonds. What's he gonna do with these holes and shells? Well, we feed them to the dairy cow. It's a great source of fiber. What's really neat about the dairy cow being a ruminant is that it can ferment our byproducts, stuff that we would throw away and the cow can convert it into a product that we can use, which is milk. All right, we have a pile of uh, canola. Canola is a product grown in the northern part of the U.S. and a lot in Canada, and it's a, it's a high protein source. So we'll feed this to the dairy cow to get our protein source. This is a pile of corn. Corn comes from uh, the Midwest of California by rail. And so when it comes to the mill, they will steam the corn make it hot so it'll roll. It's called rolled corn. They do that so the cow can digest the starch out of this corn. And starch is very important because that's what provides the energy for the cow to make all that delicious milk. All right, we're standing in front of a, this pink pile, a real dusty type of a pile. It's actually uh, millings from milling wheat. We use the wheat for bread or whatever we need it for. And the filings or the millings come to the cow, which is a byproduct once again. And the cow 
can use the fiber and the starch out of this mill run to make milk. Another one of my jobs here on the dairy is doing a lot of the computer work here. And the ones that I work with the most is really Feedwatch, which helps us to uh, feed our cows in the different ways that they need to be fed. Let me show you. And so here you see our home screen for Feedwatch. And on this home screen, you see that we have a list of all the different pens that we have. And each one of these pens gets fed a very specific ration depending on the cow's stage and their lactation or rather just their age. And you can see here we have a count of how many are just in each one of those pens. And then our target uh, amount of feed that we want to give to each cow in each pen. So if you want to look at the first one here, we feed 62 pounds of dry matter per cow in that pen. And that pen will get fed 15,165 pounds in that day. It also can show us how much that costs us per head each day. If we go over to recipes, you'll see that we have a, a list of different mixes of ingredients or recipes that we feed to each pen. We're gonna look at three, five, six, which is uh, three of our different pen numbers here. And you can see that there is a, a varying list of ingredients here and just how much of each ingredient gets mixed into that load. So for example, we have high alfalfa, which is an alfalfa with a lot more nutrient uh, in it. Low alfalfa, which obviously lower nutrient in it. We have our, our pre-mix, which is a different list of commodities that we mix together ahead of time. So that way we can be quicker at feeding our cows in the morning. And they get a little bit of corn, a little bit of soy plus. Uh, a little bit of spectrum fusion protein and water. And that will all get mixed up in the truck and fed out to those three corresponding pens. How do we know how much of these commodities to feed? Well, that's why we use a feed mixer wagon and it sits on a pair of scales. So the nutritionist will tell us how many pounds of each ingredient to dump into this mixer wagon. It mixes it all up. And then when it's finally done, it'll pull around, the tractor will take it to the cows and feed the proper amount. Um, so we have some great questions. Let's see what all we right. have. How many bales of feed does it take to feed all the cows per day? Mm. Well, you have to get feed you know, watch out, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know how I judge it by, out of all the hay that we feed, you see a truckload of hay going down the road sometimes, a full truckload. Okay, we feed one of those truckloads a day. Wow. So wow. a good 55, 58,000 pounds of hay a day go out. And you're producing <laughs> how much? And how does that relate to how much you're producing of your own? Well, like Daniel said earlier, about 40% is what we produce for ourselves. Um, yeah, and that's just because we're limited on the amount of land that we're farming right now. So we have to go and outsource the rest of it. That can be from uh, the Needles, uh, Parker area, Arizona, Utah, and um, yeah, most of those areas. Yeah, Daniel mentioned that we use a nutritionist to help balance the rations. And so they, they need uh, a minimum amount of each ingredient of each nutrient to make the milk to keep their bodies in top performing. And as you'll learn later, they're gonna have a baby calf almost every year. And so that all takes a lot of nutrition. And so we hire a nutritionist, a guy who has studied this in school and helps us take all of those commodities, puts it all together at an economical rate and, um, and and then also we have to go out and purchase all of those commodities. Sometimes we have to make contracts when prices are low. Sometimes we have to change out a commodity because the prices has increased according to markets. So not only are we managing the cows, we're also looking out for uh, feed prices and different times when they're available to us. Awesome. Well, thank you. Okay. We had someone come up with another great question. Um, how much is the production of almond milk impacting your industry? Um, 
Well, milk is, dairy milk is the number one selling product, but definitely we've seen an impact of almond milk. Um, and we like to call it almond beverage and not almond milk, but um, because it's not from, from an animal. But um, yes, we've definitely seen an impact on that. Yeah. All right, so we're gonna move on to segment four. That's your fourth um, video. So this is on breeding and ultrasound. And I don't know if Josh can give us a little snapshot of what they're gonna see. Yeah, so breeding plays a huge part in the dairy because like my dad said, um, all of our cows have a calf about once a year. So we um, use artificial insemination. So we are constantly breeding cows every single day so that we have calves every single day so that we have new cows coming into the dairy <clears throat> at a constant rate. For a cow to produce milk, she needs to have a calf. So our breeding program is a very important part of our operation. We don't have male cows or bulls on the dairy. We use artificial insemination. That way we can use the top bulls from around the world to mate our cows. Our goal is to have our cows have a calf every 13 to 14 months. Their pregnancy term is about nine months. So we start breeding our cows about 72 to 75 days after their previous calf is born. One of the unique aspects of this dairy is that we have a crossbred herd which means we use three different breeds of milking cows and that gives us several advantages over just a single bred type herd all right one of the breeds that we use on this dairy is the holstein breed which a lot of herds in california use holsteins we started out with the holstein breed they look a lot like this cow right here is a typical holstein the black and white markings, they're very well known for their high milk production. Another breed that we use on this dairy is called Swedish Reds, and that's where we get a lot of our red color from. This is a good example of a Swedish Red cow right here. She has mostly red on her, a little bit of white, but they can also be black and white too. So this the one next to her has black and white markings, but much different than the Holstein. Swedish Reds come from Sweden, and they're very well known for their milk quality, for their a little smaller size, and their longevity. Also, they're very good at getting pregnant again. A third breed that we implement on the dairy is called Montbilliarde, and they're very unique. As you can tell, they all have this uh, predominant white face. Some are black and white, some can be red and white. But Montbilliardes come from France in the Eastern mountains, and they're very well known for their strength, their longevity. They like to give lots of milk, and they last a long time on the dairy. So the advantages of crossbreeding our herd is we developed a cow that will last longer on the dairy. Uh, they eat less feed, but make more milk. So they're more profitable to us. Um, they tend to be a lot more heat tolerant for our high temperatures in the summer and uh, they like to get pregnant a lot faster and um, they're a very healthy cow in the long run and healthy cows means healthy milk. Okay, so 35 days after the cow is bred, we need to check her and see if she's pregnant or not. So you're probably wondering what this crazy contraption is that I have on, and it's an ultrasound. One of my jobs here on the dairy is to ultrasound our cows to see if they are pregnant or not. So my dad, he walks in front of the cows and he's gonna tell me which cow I need to check and how many days it's been since she was bred. All right, this cow has been bred 39 days ago, ready for check. Okay. So I reach in and inside I can feel the uterus which is where the baby grows. And on my headset right here there's a small screen and I scan and on my screen I can see if there's a baby or not. So 
So I see fluid pockets, which is a good sign. And I see the baby, so she is pregnant. And also with this device, I could check the heartbeat. And she has a heartbeat, so she is pregnant. Pregnant. What we want. And she's not open anymore, now she's pregnant. So we'll change her tail color from orange to green. And we'll move on to the next one. This cow is uh, 42 days since last bred. Okay. So again, I'm scanning, looking for that calf. And on this one, I don't see a calf. So she is what we call open or not pregnant. And she will be bred again when she comes into heat. All right, I know what you guys are thinking. You have 2000 cows. How the heck do you keep track of all those cows? Right here, I'll show you. I could look up any single animal and check out her information. So let's look up a random cow, let's say 296. 296 is in pin four. In her fourth lactation, she is pregnant due August 27th, 2021. And right now she is currently producing 88 pounds of milk. And then right here, I could see how much milk she's been producing throughout her lactation. So she started out producing, looks like 52 pounds of milk. And as her lactation went on, she climbed up in milk drastically, as you can see, all the way up to 95 pounds of milk. And it looks like she stayed right there throughout her lactation. And today she's producing right under 90 pounds. So also in this computer program, I could build different lists. I could sum up all the pins by how much milk they produce. So on this list, I could look up how many cows are in each pin. On the dairy, we have a lot of different pins. So it's important that we keep track of how many cows are in each pin. That way we know how much feed to give each pin depending on their numbers. Also, I could see how much milk each pin is producing. Pin one, 72 pounds, pin two, 83 pounds, and the list goes on and on. So this program makes it easy for us to efficiently manage our herd and all of our cows. There we go. All right. So we have a few questions here. Great footage. Um, could you discuss some of the health procedures you use with your cattle, like vaccinations, foot bath, udder health, or other things that might be in that area? Yeah, so health is, I mean, it's a very important part of dairy farming. We have, we have 2,000 head of cattle, so keeping them healthy is our number one priority. So all of our animals from being a, a baby calf all the way up to being a full grown cow, they're all on a very strict vaccination schedule and they get an assortment of different vaccinations at a certain age. That way we're doing our best to keep all of our cows healthy and free of any uh, infections or diseases that they might get. And then for uh, utter health, you noticed uh, we apply a dip to the teats before and after we milk, and that protects those teats when they leave the barn for a long period of time from bacterial infections. That really cuts down on infections of the udder called mastitis. And I think another thing we should say is we work very closely with our veterinarian in developing yes. our procedures too. I think also, you know, we do a lot to vaccinate and prevent our cows and our calves from getting sick, but they still do. They still get sick. They may get the, the runs or they may get a little bit of pneumonia. And so especially with our young stock, we're checking them front and back every day mm -hmm. and treating them and recording that and making sure that follow up treatments happen and that we can keep uh, keep them healthy that way. All right. Um, is there a foot bath 
uh, process that you're using as well? For oh yeah, so the cows, when they're done milking and they're walking out of the parlor, have to walk through a bath called a foot bath. And it has copper sulfate in there, which helps prevent any type of infections that would develop in the hoof. It also hardens the hoof and to prevent uh, like a hard object from penetrating it. In the event it does have a hard object, it will uh, disinfect it so the cow can heal up. <clears throat> and in addition to foot baths, the cows also get pedicures uh, probably twice a year <laughs> where uh, we trim their hooves or if they do have a, a lameness problem, the hoof trimmer will tilt her up on her side, take a look at the hoof and treat it as necessary. Um, and, what and one more thing to follow up with that, you know, we have 15 employees here and, and every day they work with our cows. So they know, they know what a healthy cow looks like. So the second we see a cow that might be a little bit depressed or a little bit slow or not, not acting normal, we're sure to pull that cow out right away and just do a physical examination of that cow and make sure, make sure we figure out what's going on and, and we treat that cow and make sure that she gets healthy as, as quick as possible. All right. Uh, what's the average years of service on like a cow in your, at your dairy? As we mentioned before, we have a crossbred herd and they tend to last longer than the average Holstein herd. And so we have cows anywhere from uh, our average, I'd say would be five years of milking. Yeah, it takes two years to grow them, five years on average. Um, our oldest cow is 11 years milking here. So she's an old cow. <laughs> and but doing great. Yeah, we have, we have um, and, uh, uh, cows that last a long time on the dairy. So is it like, okay, you're going to take a cow out of service after they drop a certain percentage of milk production? Is that kind of your rule of thumb? Yeah, so we try and make sure the cow has a calf every year and some will not get pregnant for how hard we have tried. And cows are always on a lactation curve, which means she produces a lot of milk after she has a calf. And that slowly dwindles down to a point where it's no longer feasible to feed the cow and her to pay for that feed from the milk. And so then she will be sold to uh, auctioneers or meat packers that will buy them for their, for their meat. And not only their meat, but everything about the cow is being used. Awesome, okay, great. Um, how many dead calves do you get per year? Um, no, it doesn't happen frequently for us. We probably average, I don't know, two to three yeah. uh, dead cows a month, three being max. Um, and calves? And calves, um, about the same. We might lose, yeah, two or three a month um, for a variety of reasons, but... I'd say for how many animals we have, our death loss is very small. All right, thank you. Um, has COVID impacted um, the ag industry? Um, has it influenced in the way that you are handling different procedures? Like, has it changed anything that you're doing now? Um, luckily, most of our work is outside that we do. And uh, most of the times we're not very close to each other. So a lot of our guys have chosen to wear masks and um, we make sure we're safe there. But luckily with our environment, it hasn't affected us too much. Now the business part of selling the milk has changed a lot. But as far as the dairy operations, that has stayed the same. A, a lot of our um, operations and procedures is already built to kill bacteria and prevent the, the transfer of bacteria. We were already doing that. So um, once COVID hit, we didn't really have to change that much because we were already doing it. All right, good points. Um, how do you track how much milk a cow is producing in order to track their production or record keeping? That's a good question. So um, once a month, we have a company that comes in and they have um, a set of meters 
that they hook up to our milking machines in line with the milking mach machines. And what they do is they record what cow is on which machine, they measure her milk, and they record all that on a computer. And um, that way on that computer, we could look up a cow and we could see how much milk she produced on that day. Uh, that way we're getting a good idea of which ones are, are producing a lot of milk and which ones are starting to slack off a little bit and, and producing less milk. And then also every single day we have trucks that are leaving the dairy full of milk, big milk trucks, and they're weighed. That way we can keep a track of how much milk we produce total every single day. And then we can divide that by how many cows that we milk that day and we could get a good average of how much milk we produce. So how exactly does the machine know which cow is being milked? Yeah, so that's all um, up to the person who is attaching those meters. He needs to look up and look at the cow's ear tag, little ID, and then he records, um, he manually punches in her number into this little handheld computer he has. And uh, <clears throat> then he records how much milk he produced or that cow produced, and that's how we know. Um, is there a limit for how many times a cow can get pregnant? Yeah, as long as they keep producing the milk and, and their feet and legs are strong, we keep breeding them. We have some great questions here, so I'm gonna yeah. keep on yeah, going awesome. with them, okay? So what do you guys do with the bull calves? Bull calves are sold uh, as day olds. So we have a ranch that will buy them on a daily basis, but they're treated the same. So every calf that's born and we'll have a segment that will explain how we take care of our calves. They're all treated the same, but the bulls will be sold to a ranch and uh, their job is then to raise them up and do with them as they please. Awesome. Now, I know you had um, talked about having crossbreeding and, and using innovative um, processes or methods to get the most, and you know, to get a healthier cow, to get the most production. Are those things that you had to learn from your experience in the industry, or is this something that is normal and um, kind of across the industry and in use? Well, that's a good question. That is something that we had to learn. And um, the dairy community is, is pretty tight. We go to shows, we go to uh, online uh, seminars and stuff like that, but mainly we talk together. And I have a cousin that has been crossbreeding a lot longer. And so I was in, uh, talking to him, I went to his dairy, uh, me and the partners, we checked out his cows and really liked what we saw, thought it would fit our operation. And so we started. I'm going to be talking about um, fresh cows. So if you can, can just go ahead and mention a little bit about fresh cows while I get this next video up. Yeah, so uh, like we just talked about with breeding, we're breeding cows every day, which means we have uh, babies born every single day. So this video is explaining a little bit of the process of us bringing in a baby and feeding it its colostrum and getting it prepared uh, for his life. All right, thank you. Okay, we are here in the maternity area of the dairy and we have about four to six fresh cows every single day. Now, what's a fresh cow? A fresh cow is a cow that recently had its baby. So we get new babies all the time and we have a crew that takes care of those new babies every single day. And when a new baby is born, they'll go out to the corral, get her, and first thing they do is weigh the calf. It's very important that we know how much each calf weighs. They're also going to feed that calf its colostrum right away. So each calf gets three quarts of colostrum in order to build its, its immune system and to help it grow. Now all this information gets tracked on this log right here. That way we can always look back and we know what calf was born to what mom 
and we know what breed they are because we have three different breeds on the dairy and it helps us keep track of everything. All that information is then entered in onto our computer. Okay, so we have a fresh cow here. She just had a calf this morning. So we hooked up the milk machine to her and all of her good colostrum is going into this can because we don't want it going into the milk line because we don't want it in the tank. We want to collect it and feed it to the calves. Okay, we're done milking the fresh cow. And now we have her colostrum in this milk can. And if you look at it, it doesn't look like regular milk. It's real thick, kind of foamy. And that's because it's full of nutrients and antibodies. Those nutrients help the calf to grow big and strong. And those antibodies help it to build up its immune system to stay healthy. Okay, right away, we're gonna pour the colostrum into a bottle and try not to spill it everywhere. We're gonna put on the nipple and put it in the fridge right away. The colostrum will grow bacteria if it stays warm for too long, so we'll put it in the fridge. Now that it's in the fridge, it'll cool down and we'll be able to store it for a lot longer. And then when we get a fresh calf, we'll warm it up real quick and give it to her right away. All right, now that we got the colostrum harvested, we need to test it. And to test it, we use a refractometer and we can tell how many solids are in the colostrum. And that tells us how much nutrients are in there and how much antibodies are in the colostrum because we only want to use the best for our cats. But the other colostrum that doesn't quite make the cut, we bring over here. We put it in buckets, freeze it, and a company comes and picks it up, and they're able to use this colostrum to make medicine for humans. Um, I do have a question. So do they wait for the calf to wean, or do they take them right away? So. That's a good question. Yeah, so once the calf is born, um, it's real wet, obviously, because it was just born. So we allow the mom to lick it, clean it up, wait till it's standing, walking around. And then if the calf wants to uh, drink any colostrum right away from its mom, it has a chance to do that. <clears throat> and then once that's done, we'll bring the calf in and then we'll feed it our colostrum to make sure it's getting all of, all of the colostrum that it needs to, to get it off on a good start. And then right after that, the mom will go into the milking part of the dairy. And then our calf will go into our calf raising facility, which you will see in the next video. Okay, wonderful. I don't see any more questions. So we'll go ahead and get to that next video. And that one's going to be about calves and heifers. So. Hey guys, my name is Joshua DeVries. One of my jobs here is to take care of all these babies. Here we usually have about 100 calves that we're raising up to eventually go back to the dairy. My calf feeder, Artemio, is on his way right now with the milk, so we're gonna feed him. So before we feed them milk, they all have water in their buckets and we need to put milk in their buckets. So we're gonna dump out the water. That way Artemio can come through and fill it up with milk. All these calves are fed three quarts of milk twice a day. Every single day. They, they like consistency. They like to be fed at the same time. 
they like the same amount of milk. So with this milk trailer, it gives them exactly three quarts every time we feed the calves. That way it makes it fast, it makes it efficient, it makes it consistent. On top of milk, we feed all the calves what's called a starter grain. Come take a look. In this starter grain, it's full of nutrients that the calf needs to grow. It's got some corn in there, it's got a supplement pellet, it's got a little bit of cotton seed, and it's covered in molasses. That molasses is to make it sweet so the cows eat it. Okay, milk is fed, grain is fed, now before we put water in their buckets, we need to clean these buckets. So to clean these buckets, we have basically a dishwasher for buckets. We set it on, hit a switch, it cleans the buckets for about five seconds. Clean and ready to go. <laughs> the calves come back here at about a week old as you can see, these ones are pretty small, kind of little. So at seven days old, they're coming back to this area. And right when they come back here, we go ahead and we dehorn them and we vaccinate them for pneumonia. These calves, they're a lot bigger. They're about 70 days old and they're off of milk. So all they eat is grain. And in a couple days, they'll go on to our heifer ranch that's just down the road. So at 75 days old, those calves leave the hutches and they come here to our heifer ranch where I watch over and make sure they're well fed and well taken care of. And then once they're pregnant, two years old, they move back to the dairy where they're about ready to have their first calf. All right, we have one question um, and it is about the colostrum. So what type of medicine is made with the colostrum, if you know that? Yeah, that's a very good question. Do you know the answer? Yeah, so the company that picks it up uses that colostrum for its antibodies that are in the immunoglobins, whatever that is. Uh, but what I've, they told me, is they use it a lot for uh, diarrhea in children where nothing else works, especially in third world uh, countries. Mm -hmm. All right, okay. Um, I have a question. I mean, you have, there's so much going on and you, you know, you're, your goal is to be efficient and productive. How much innovation takes place that you guys actually have to innovate and figure out how to make things better? And you can buy a lot of stuff, but you know, it might not be out there. So are you having to innovate and invent things to make your- <laughs> Constantly. <laughs> yeah, stop. Yes, all the time. So trade shows, talking to other dairymen, learning uh, new technologies through our veterinarians and our nutritionists and uh, uh, so many other people, uh, salespeople, salespeople that come with new technologies. So uh, yeah, we learn a lot, all that costs money. So we have to weigh that against what is, how it will work in our operation. And we've um, implemented a lot of, them. so the calf pins, that's, they just look like regular calf pins. A lot of design went into those calf pins. They're lined with a plastic coat, so they're soft on the calf. They're raised above the ground, so the calf is healthy. They've got feeders that stay clean when they, and, uh, and, and they're separated. If, if you kept the calves together, they can spread diseases uh, fairly uh, quickly. So we keep them separated for the first 75 days. And that's just one of them. Awesome. Um, so we are on to our last segment. It's about your solar field and energy process. So right. um, I'm going to go ahead and get that on. You can give a little snippet of what to expect. All right. We've uh, put the solar field in uh, about five years ago. And um, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Probably one of the easiest innovations we've done. Okay, we're here 
at the solar field, which is located on the dairy, and the solar panels produce all the electricity, well, about 85 to about 88 percent of our power needs. It's a 425 kilowatt system. The power generated from these panels operate the milking facility, which includes vacuum pumps, air compressors, chiller machines, and lights, a lot of lights on the place. We also use it to operate our water wells, which irrigate all our fields to produce the crops. Some of you have heard that Hinkley has a water problem caused by PG&E. There is a chromium-6 plume located about three miles west of us. And um, as of now, our water is chromium-6 free. We test our water every six months for it, and we've never had an issue with that. And over the years, we have worked with PG&E on a number of issues, and they're very professional, easy to work with, and we've never had an issue with PG&E. They're very good to be neighbors with. All the work that goes into this dairy, all the farming, the feeding of the calves, the feeding of the cows, the milking, uh, taking care of the cows, the breeding, the milking of the cows, all accumulates into this room. Our herd produces 8,500 gallons of milk every single day. Enough milk to fill up one of these huge silos. So now that our milk silos are full, it's time for the milk to get picked up. Follow me. This milk tanker will come on a routine basis and pick up our milk and they bring it to a creamery. And that creamery will bottle the milk, it'll make butter, it'll make cheese, it'll make our own favorite, ice cream. Thank you for following along with us on our virtual tour of Hinkley Dairy. Please support your local dairies by going to your grocery store, buying butter, cheese, ice cream, and real milk and follow along with us on Instagram. Thank you so much, that was awesome. Uh, I really appreciate all of your effort that it took to create those segments. <laughs> we do have another uh, part that we aren't gonna be able to project, but it's about the um, job opportunities. So the careers, you talked about 14, 15 um, employees that you have at the dairy, um, but if you can, um, speak to those, and I believe the first one was dairy manager. You can talk about that position. Uh, yeah, so um, a lot of you guys might be watching this video and thinking, you know, how the heck do I get involved on a dairy? It kind of seems like you need to get born into it or have some sort of connection. Um, and that's, that's not really the case. Um, dairymen all of them across America are looking for good help. It's really rare to find someone who is hardworking and really has a passion for the dairy industry right now. So there's a huge demand for it. And um, to start that process, it's, it's really important to be involved in your local 4-H club or your local FFA and just start to get involved in agriculture. And develop that those relationships with local dairy farmers and meet them personally work with them a little bit and start working for them all dairymen are looking for um, a hand every once in a while especially in the summer times it's not easy work it's not always fun but it is rewarding so if, if you think you want to learn more about dairy farming just get involved in your local 4-h clubs and, and meet the local dairy farmers um, so a dairy manager would be that person that's involved in every part of pretty much what you yeah. showed us, right? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So it's important to work from the bottom and, and work your way up. That way you've spent time in every single job and you know how tough every job is and, and you learn how to manage people. Also, learning Spanish. A lot of our employees are Spanish speakers and and that's the case with most dairies. So if you spend the time and learn Spanish, you um, are automatically that more attractive to a dairy farmer. 
Awesome. Okay. And you talked about a veterinarian. So do you have a full-time vet or is that someone you contract with? We have a relationship. You, and, and the state law says that you, you need to have a good relationship with a veterinarian. So our veterinarian is on contract who visits every other week. And, uh, and she's a she, and she will uh, diagnose any problems that we may have ongoing or a trend that's going on that we can't figure out, or uh, she'll do surgeries on the dairy and um, uh, give us the latest updates as to what vaccinations to be using, uh, all kinds of stuff. And so state regulations, they're up on that. Uh, nutritionists, uh, agronomist. Agronomist is a person who knows uh, crops, fields, waters, uh, bugs, weeds, um, mechanics, welders, electricians, plumbers, sales. So, and that's just on the dairy. Once that milk leaves the dairy, it goes to a creamery. That's a whole nother set of job opportunities that you can have working with the milk. And so, like Josh said, the best way is to get involved with your 4-H FFA. Do you really like working with animals? Um, yeah, it's a career, but it's also a, a, a living, a life. It's a way of life. Um, I know Dwayne would be a great asset. Also, the Victor Valley College has several options for you to get into agricultural through natural resources or resource convert conservation areas. And Neville Slade at the Victor Valley College is a good reference to get a hold of and uh, see where your opportunities are for that. What, what kind of advice would you give them? You know, if they couldn't get involved in dairy work right away, you know, they wanted, they, they wanted to go into this industry and maybe not just with dairy, but agriculture in general. Um, are there certain skill sets that could help them if they acquire them early on and what mm -hmm. would they be? Well, I think a, a big thing is work ethics. So you need to be able to uh, get up early in the morning, willing to work hard. We work every day, you know, our dairy never stops, but that doesn't mean you have time off. We have plenty of guys to take uh, other people for days off, but you need to have a, a way of life and a love for agriculture and animals. Anything to add to that, Josh or Daniel? <laughs> it's a job where, you know, a lot of people look at the clock. Um, they're waiting for five to come around because five o'clock is when they can go home. Uh, if you're like that, this is not the career path for you. You know, we're about the, the job and the job is done once it is finished. It's not based on the clock. Um, so would which um, doesn't mean we work 15 hours a day some days, <laughs> days. Uh, some days are long days it's not like we're non-stop working all the time and tired of it you know it just means you know what we're, we're here to do a job we're here to take care of these animals the best that we can we're here to take care of these fields the best that we can and sometimes that takes 14 hours a day and sometimes it only takes six so uh, we're just all about getting all the work done. Um, awesome. um, Dwayne, I don't, uh, Mr. Penfold, I don't know if you would like to speak to the program at VVC because I know that you work there as well. So I know Neville's not here right now. Yeah, I think, I think Neville's been around to each of our high schools already, but if he hasn't, just remind students that we have a series of animal science courses equine science, uh, sustainable agriculture, uh, and we're adding more all the time. So um, yeah, certainly students can get a, a, a good start on their agriculture education right here in the Victor Valley, and then transfer to any of the major five agricultural colleges that we have in California. This video was a very broad overview of what we do here on the dairy, just a very general, a little bit of everything. But uh, we're all about educating the public on dairy farming, and we want everyone to know the truth about dairy farming. So we started an Instagram page. So go follow us on Instagram, and, and we give more in-depth information that we try to make entertaining. 
Uh, so follow along with us. And if you want to contact us, you can do that through Instagram. Or if you want to just keep up with us, do it that way too. Now, what was that? It was at Hinkley Dairy? At Hinkley Dairy. Yeah, super simple. That is super simple. <laughs> okay, guys, um, have a wonderful day. And uh, we appreciate all of your time. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Bye, very guys. much. Bye. 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 It's uh, nice and dry. Duh. You know what? <laughs> we it all over our fields. This provides nutrition. Straight from our cows. Uh, a lot of. No, I explain that. I think that's good. We have cereal grains. Uh, Dang it. Sprinkler just abstract. Take all of the different fat and protein. And three, shoot. Go ahead. <laughs> hey, thank you for taking the tour with us on Hinkley Dairy and Farms. And we hope you really enjoyed the tour. Let's redo that. <laughs> it takes me three times. <laughs>